Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he speaks in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet, who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. Now, Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If one, anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know it as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating at an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Fourth Sunday after Epiphany Gospel is Mark 1, 21 through 28. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing the man and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee.
Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we meditate in your word, you will open it to us, that we might see Jesus, we ask in his precious name, amen. It might be easy to get sidetracked while we consider our texts today. For example, we might spend a good amount of time wondering how to apply this what to us seems an odd situation in Corinth, how we apply that situation to us today. What is our equivalent to eating meat sacrificed to idols? Now that's a worthy pursuit, and it would be good for us to consider that, but maybe that's not where the text today really take us. Interwoven into the conversation about meat offered to idols and eating that meat. Instead, I think we can find, or I know we can find, the foundation. The prophet spoken of through Moses. The teacher with authority. Let's sift through then our Corinthian lesson and see the foundation. At some point, and maybe in another circumstance, it's good for us to consider our behavior. We will talk a little bit about how it is we respond to the foundational truths that Paul presents to us, that the Holy Spirit presents to us, inspired in Paul's writing. But we want to find those foundational truths first, because they then affect our fellowship with God and our fellowship with each other. So, I would take us to verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 8, where we read, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Our fellowship with God, our fellowship with each other that flows from our fellowship with God, needs to have this basic truth as its foundation. How we live out our lives is based fully on who God is, and what God has done and continues to to do for us. And so the confession here begins with that we know that for us there is but one God. There is only one God. So in the context of 1 Corinthians 8, it really is nothing if people are eating food sacrificed to idols because in reality they are not a true God. There is only one true, one God, the Father. And then in parallel to that, we recognize that there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ. And so we have here a glimpse into this wonderful theology that we have that we call the theology of the Trinity. Now the Holy Spirit isn't specifically mentioned here, but we begin our understanding of who God is by knowing that the Father and the Son, that the Father and Jesus Christ are the same God. We don't have two gods, and, and this is the mystery that we see. And the clue here to this unity of the Father and the Son is in that from both and through both are all things, and that from both and through both we have our very existence. We don't have two creators, we have one creator. And so in this mystery of Scripture, we have this foundational truth, that we have one God, we call him the Father. 
that we have one Lord, we call him Jesus Christ. But we do not have two gods, we have only one, one God, and that then becomes the foundation for our understanding of God and leads us simply to accept this mystery. A mystery then that is played out for us in the Incarnation, in the Epiphany, in Christ with us for a specific purpose. So let's, as we call from 1 Corinthians 8, the foundational truths, move to verse 11. It reads, And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Again, we want to deal honestly with the content of this part of Paul's letter, Remembering that when we act in ways that would lead a brother or sister in Christ away from Christ, there's a problem there. But in order to understand that problem, or that there is a problem, again, we need to find the foundation. So it's important that we not get distracted by the, so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, part of verse 11. It's a truth, and we don't want to ignore it, but we want to first see the foundational truth that's in that verse, and so instead of focusing on the knowledge that we have, that by acting on it might be detrimental to the faith of a believer, of a brother or sister in Christ, or a non-believer for that matter, the focus here and the foundational truth here is that we are to think first of our brother or sister, of others, and, and in this context it is other believers, but certainly as we live out our life in this world, how we live is also seen by unbelievers. And we ought to be careful about how we live in the view of unbelievers, and so our thinking here is not about ourselves first, but about others. And our thinking about others is in the context of the end of verse 11 and the words, for whom Christ died. Why ought we be concerned about the spiritual welfare of others? Because Christ died for them. Well, what does that mean? And how does that tie into the foundations of who God is? Right, so we have, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. We don't have two gods, or three gods when we include the Holy Spirit. We have one God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, and in the mystery of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity came to us, became one of us, with the very purpose of dying. And not just of dying, but of dying the death we deserve. The sentence against us, because we have broken and continue to break God's law, because we are lawbreakers at the core of who we are, is death. Not just the death of the body, and certainly not annihilation. We are not annihilists. We do not believe that after this death we simply cease to exist. That is certainly not a biblical teaching. And so when we say death, we are really talking about our eternal existence and a death in the eternity is not that our spirits or even our bodies do not exist, but that they exist separated from God. That is the true death. And when we 
live out our life in the world, we need to be constantly remembering that our witness to the world, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also to the world, is seen. And so we need to be thinking of the other, for whom Christ died. Jesus, who came specifically, not just to be a teacher with authority, not just to show his authority over the demons, but in his death to prove his power over death and over the sin that brings death. So that through that death and the resurrection that proves his victory, we receive forgiveness. We are reconciled to God. We come into a new fellowship, a restored fellowship with the one God and one Lord. So the foundational truth here is that Christ died, that his death was in our place for our sin and in the place of our brothers and sisters and in the place of all people so that we would not have to be eternally separated from God, so that we would not perish, so that we would not indeed die. Well, this has a profound effect in how we understand God and live in fellowship with God, and in how we understand our neighbor and live in fellowship with our neighbor. And we see that in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 8. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So ultimately, when we act selfishly in whatever manifestation in life that is, we are not only hurting our brothers and sisters in Christ, or even those in the world who, for whom Christ died, but we are sinning against Christ himself. And so then we are reminded of the words that Moses spoke to the people. The context of our Deuteronomy reading is the people of Israel are ready to go into the Promised Land. They have spent 40 years in the wilderness uh, being punished for their disobedience, but now they are ready to go into the land that God has promised them. And Moses is reminding them before he sends them across the Jordan River into the Promised Land of how 41 years earlier at the mountain, God had spoken to them and appeared to them in fire and brought about great fear among them. So that they asked Moses, or God through Moses, for a speaker rather than God speaking directly to them. And so as Moses reminded them of those events, he prophesied about Jesus. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And then the warning that there are dire consequences for those who do not listen. And so when we consider our fellowship with Christ and our call to not sin against Christ, we are reminded that that has to do with listening to the prophet that God raised up. And we see that also in Mark, in our Gospel today, in verse 27, we read the reaction that the people had when Jesus cast the demon out of the demon-possessed man. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And so Moses 
And does Mark, as he record, recorded this event, point us to Jesus? Even as the Holy Spirit, writing through Paul, points us to Jesus. So hearing the words from Moses, and recognizing in Jesus, the prophet, that we are to listen to, and seeing this event in Mark, the authority that even the unclean spirits obey him, we too are called to listen to Jesus, to be obedient to him, and in so not sin against Christ. Father, we pray that we would build our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, through whom and for whom all things exist, who came to us offering himself the final and perfect sacrifice in his death in our place to prove his power over sin and death, over the unclean spirits, to set us free from our bondage to sin and death. And so we pray that we would experience that freedom, and in that freedom, listen and obey. We ask in Jesus' precious name,